you to open a Bible to God's Word in Micah chapter 6, and I'm going to warn you, but we're going to look at a lot of Bible verses this morning. So if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, a recommendation would be uh, use the table of contents or just grab a pen or pencil and write down the references and you can read them later. And so we're going to be hopping throughout God's Word. So we're in the middle of a sermon series called God's Work. Our witness. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter boldly stands up in front of a huge crowd of people who didn't necessarily know or believe in Jesus or know who he was. And Peter tells them the gospel. He says that Jesus died on a cross and then God raised him from the dead. And then Peter proclaims, and of that, we are all witnesses. And so Peter is summarizing the mission and the ministry of being a Christian and being a church together, that that we are witnesses to the work of God in Jesus, that we believe that in Christ on the cross, God was redeeming us and saving us and forgiving our sins, and not just our sins, but he was doing this work for the whole world to be redeemed. And then after he died, God raised him from the dead, conquering death and sin and evil once and for all, and that Those of us who believe in him get that promise and that gift of resurrection and eternal life. And so last week we talked about how wonderful that is, right? And everybody remembers the whole point of the benediction now, right? Because you were all paying attention. All right, I'm going to say it again this week. Don't worry, it's in the bulletin, okay? But the whole idea is that this is how much God loves us. This is how much in Jesus he has redeemed you from forgiven you for every single sin, mistake, and shortcoming. And that when he looks upon you, no matter how you feel about yourself, no matter what you're going through in life, that he looks upon you with joy and glad, smiles and rejoices over you. But as Peter said, that's wonderful good news. That's the work of God in Jesus Christ, right? That's the gospel that we treasure and hold so dearly. But then Peter also said, and and we're all witnesses. And his whole point was, now I'm telling all of you about it. And so for us as Christians, we are to follow the example of Peter and the apostles in the early church and say, we celebrate this work of God and Jesus Christ, this wonderful, beautiful work of forgiveness and redemption and salvation. But we don't keep it to ourselves. We go into the world loving and serving and sharing and proclaiming that good news so that more and more people will know Jesus loves them, right? How many of you learned the song, Jesus Loves Me, when you were a little kid, right? Some of you probably still have it memorized, right? It's a good one. I want you to think about it this way. All that joy and happiness that comes from that little hymn, right? All the wonderful comfort that it brings. Wouldn't it be great if more and more people knew that comfort, Right? The comfort of that good news, of what that song says, of what that good news of the gospel of God's work in Jesus Christ for us. And so over the coming weeks, I'm going to tell you what we're doing. You're you're welcome. For all of you who are list makers and planners and never know what I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you right now. All right, so as a group of leadership team and spiritual care and other lay leaders, we have been working together and praying together about what it means for us to be a church. And what it means for us to celebrate that good news of this is what God has done in Jesus for us. And then for us to pray and think about and see where God leads us up. What does it mean for us here in Kansas City to be witnesses to that good news? And so here is what we're going to be about. I'm just telling you. And they come from the Bible, so you can't get mad at me. Fair enough? All right. And, and we're going to do it. You know Why? Because it comes from the bot. That was not a trick question. Y'all should know me by now, right? Because it comes from God's word. And he- here's a summary of our whole ministry. It- it- whatever God's word says, we're, we're going to do that. We're not going to make up new things. We're just going to, oh, this is what God tells us to do. We're going to be obedient. We're going to be faithful witnesses, all right? So here it is. This week, we're talking about mercy, right? God's work of mercy for his people, his command to his people to show mercy and kindness to those who are hurting, those who need comfort, those who need help in the world. Next week, we're going to talk about fellowship, how God is a God of relationships, that he has redeemed us and reconciled us to himself. 
And he's given us the gift of forgiveness so we could share that gift of forgiveness with others so that we could do life and ministry and the Great Commission not on our own, but that we would do it together. That we would follow Jesus together, invite others into those relationships. After that, we're going to talk about missions, right? The, the whole summary of what the church is to do comes from Jesus, right? He didn't, like, leave us guessing. He didn't, today we were celebrating ascent. He didn't ascend into heaven and go, you'll figure it out, right? He told us, right, while he was ascending, here's what I want you to do. We've given it a name. Anybody know the name? The Great Commission, right? He said, this is what I want my church to do. To go into the whole world, wherever you find yourself, and share the gospel. So as a church, we're going to make missions a priority, both here and abroad. And then finally, in the last week, we're going to talk about worship. Now, we're not going to get into a fight <clears throat> about what should be in a bulletin, what shouldn't be in a bulletin, what divine service we should do or shouldn't do, what style of worship we should do or shouldn't do, because the Bible doesn't actually care about that. The Bible cares about our hearts and the content of our, of our worship and the object of our worship, who is Jesus. We were worshiping and praising him. And the Bible tells us that the whole point of worship is to invite others to worship the God who loves them and redeems them in Jesus. See, worship doesn't become about you and me. It's about Jesus and those who need to hear his good news. All right, so if you're taking notes, here we go. Mercy, fellowship, missions, and worship. And if you're like, I forgot, don't worry, because I'm going to tell you again, okay? <laughs> All right, so this morning, as we taste, that I want us to think biblically about mercy. And the first comes from Micah chapter 6. If you have a Bible, you can follow along your bulletin chapter Six, there's all these questions. That, what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Born for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. These are all kinds of rhetorical questions because the, the prophet is with his sin and the sin of God's people, and he's wondering, how do we get out of this mess? What, what's required of me? Right? We have guilt. We've done wrong. So, so what do we do to get out of that mess? Now, he's asking in relationship to his God, but we do this as human beings with others all the time, right? Anybody ever done something wrong to somebody else? Or at least you want to admit it, okay, right? <clears throat> Anybody ever asked or you've been asked the question, what can I do to fix it or make it up to you or make it better, right? Anybody ever done that? And that's, that's driven by guilt, right? Like, I, I know I messed up. I feel terrible about it. I, I love you. I want to make it up for you. And, you know, people make really crazy outlandish promises in those moments, right? And I'm like, I will do any. No, you're not. You're not going to do anything. Stop lying. Okay, that's step one. All right. But that's what we do, right? When we, we mess up, we're like, how do I fix this? How, how do I bridge the gap here? How do I heal this? How do I make it better? And the prophet Micah is wrestling with this question when it comes to his relationship and the people of Israel, the people of God's relationship with God. Lord, Lord, we've messed up. We have sinned. We have not followed your word. We've not done what you wanted us to do. We've worshiped other gods. We've been punished for it. We've not trusted you with the things that you've given to us. So how are we going to make it up? And he says the, the biggest promises, right? Just like you and I do with our human relation. I'll do anything. Just please forgive me. I'll, I'll make it up to you. I prom I'll do this. I'll do it even better next time. Eh, maybe you will. Maybe you won't. And so he's asking all these rhetorical questions. What, what can I do? Do I, do I come in? What if I bow myself in worship, right? But, like I really lay myself low and let God know, here's how sorry I am, Lord, right? Make a big show of it. I just want you to know, Lord, here's, here's how sorry I am. Shall I bring burnt offerings and calves a year old? So should I bring the best of what I have 
as a sacrifice and say, you know what, Lord, this will fix it. I'll, I'll bring this thing to you. I'll do this thing for you. I'll give this thing away, and then and it will be good. Right? Then his next question, thousands of rams, tens of thousands of rams over the world. What he's saying is, like, the infinite amount of sacrifices that I could possibly make, I will give to you, Lord. I will make them every single day. I will punish myself every single day. I'll, I'll never be happy again. Like, like, I'll just write those kinds of outlandish promises that we try to do to negotiate, to fix a relationship. And then he asks, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He's asking a question like, well, I couldn't give you anything more precious to me than my firstborn born, right? So what should I do? Is that what you want, God? Tell me what I can do, Lord, to, to make it up. Now, the good news is none of those are actually the answer. And in a wonderful twist and turn of the gospel, the one who ends up giving up their firstborn in order to redeem us is God, right? He gives away his son, for you and I. So instead of us having to make the sacrifice to heal the relationship, it's God, right? That, that's the wonderful mercy of God is like, we're like, we'll do anything, Lord, right? We'll make it up to you. We'll make endless sacrifices. We'll, we'll show you in our worship just how much we love you. We'll sing praises. We'll, we'll bow ourselves down. We'll do anything. And none of them measure up. Sacrifice that does measure up and becomes good news for you and I is that God gives his own son away so we don't have to. He makes the ultimate sacrifice so you and I, instead of having to go, okay, what else do I have to do to make it up to you? We just get to go, how wonderful is the mercy of God in our lives. That we are like Micah and the people of God back then. We've messed up, we've made mistakes and sometimes we're gonna be like, okay, I'll do better next week. Right? I'll, I'll try harder next time. I'll try not to lose my temper. I'll try not to say that or do that. I'll, I'll, I won't disappoint you, Lord. I will come through on my promise this time. Anybody ever broken a promise to God? Like, I'll do it, Lord. I promise. Next week, you're like, oh, man, I totally forgot. But next week, <laughs> I'll fulfill two promises. And the good news for you and I is God goes, well, you, you can't do anything. I'm not going to ask you to do anything because I'm going to do it for you. That's God's mercy that he shows to his people. And then comes the answer in verse 8 of, like, okay, in, in light of God's mercy for Micah and the people of Israel, in light of God's mercy for you and I, he's saying, look, I've, I've fixed it for you. I've healed the relationship for you. I've made the sacrifice for you. Now here's how I want you to live. And it's not complicated. That's what I love about God's word. He's just like, just, it's right here, guy, to you this morning, right? He's like, this is what I want. He says, he has told you, O man, or O people, what is good, <laughs> right? You're going like, I wonder what God's will for my life is. That is by far my favorite question to get from church members, hands down. And I really mean that. I know you're thinking, oh, he's been sarcastic. No, I really mean it. It's my favorite question because it's super easy to answer. I know you're like, what? Well, verse 8 is one of the answers. And then in the Gospel of John, in case you don't believe me, Jesus says, here's the will of God that you accept. So if you believe in Jesus, guess what? You're doing God's will for your life. Take a breath. Relax. And go, oh, okay, I'm on track. All right? But in the meantime, God says this. Here's what he has told you, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you, Right? I'm going to make sacrifice. I'm going to do all these things. Here's what it is. Do justice. Just do, ju do what is right. Help those who are being mistreated or harmed or afflicted. Stand up for those who are hurting and in need of protection. Love kindness. And we'll come back to this word. And to walk humbly with your God. So don't be an arrogant Christian. It's the worst thing on planet Earth is an arrogant Christian. 
Because you and I have been saved and redeemed by God's kindness and mercy and grace, right? We just read all of these questions like, well, what could I do? And God's answer is nothing because I'm sending Jesus. And so it's the most hypocritical posture we could possibly have as humans to be arrogant Christians and go, look how much better I am than you. It's like, no, you're not. You're a terrible, poor, miserable sinner. We said it every Sunday in the confession, right? And then some of you are like, I don't like that. Well, then stop being one. Good luck, though, okay? Right? Well, you and I confess every week, I'm a poor, miserable sinner, and then we're going to go outside in the world and brag, I am so much better than you. What? No, you didn't. Yeah, you're a poor, miserable sinner. The difference is you've, you've been able to receive and enjoy God's grace and mercy in your life. So as Paul says in Ephesians, we brag not about what we do, but about what God has done. And this is what it means to walk humbly with your God, that I, I'm following Jesus by his grace, by his mercy, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But I'm doing it with humility, knowing all I am is the sinner redeemed by God's grace. So as I follow him in his footsteps, my job is to invite you to receive his grace and mercy as well. Not to brag about, look how farther along I am than you. Now, what I want to focus on is this phrase, to love kindness. Now, if you open English Bibles and various translations, that phrase will say about a dozen different words. Because the Hebrew word is chesed. And it's this word that shows up all over the Old Testament. And sometimes it's translated as kindness. Sometimes it's translated as favor. Sometimes it's translated as grace. Sometimes it's translated as steadfast love right? Faithful love, consistent love. And other times it's translated as mercy. And when you go to seminary, that gets super duper fun when your professors are grading your papers, okay? You're like, which one is it? You're like, I don't know, man. Look, I just picked my favorite, okay? So here's the question that we used to ask our Hebrew professors. And I know some of you are like, well, which one is it, Pastor Mark? We would ask our Hebrew professors, well, which one is it? (laughs) You have the PhD, please tell us. And I remember uh, one of my professors looked at us, he goes, Here's the beauty of the word. He says, it's all of them. It's a summary of God's character and posture towards his people. That when we look at God, he is chesed, that he is full of mercy and favor and grace and kindness and steadfast, faithful love for his people. And then what does he tell his people to do after receiving it? He says, I want you to love it. What does it mean to to love mercy? So mercy, in a theological sense, means not getting the punishment or judgment that I deserve, right? So when we talk about God's mercy, it's in response to all those questions the prophet just asked. What can I do to make up for my sin? What can I do to make God pleased with me? What can I do to make him happy and rejoice over me? And the answer being, well, nothing, because... I'm a poor, miserable sinner, and what do I deserve? To be punished and judged for my sins. But then in the confession, after we say, I'm a poor, miserable sinner, what do we say? Have mercy on us, right? And what's the good news of absolution? He's had mercy on you in Jesus. That the punishment that you and I deserve went on him. So here's what mercy looks like in our actions. How many of you have ever looked down on somebody else? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) Just want you to think about it for a moment. You saw somebody or a group of people, and you, in your mind, immediately the first thing that you thought was, wow, look, a child of God. Or was it, wow, I can't believe they live like that or behave like that, think like that, vote like that. Work. You know what I mean? Of course you know what I mean, right? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call you out so bad. I'm like, raise your hand, everybody. But haven't we all done that? Look down on others. I'm better than you. Why? Huh? Because of my own metrics and systems. And sometimes we think, no, they deserve to be treated that way. They deserve the consequence of their actions. They deserve their lot in life, right? That's the mentality that that breeds, that, that way of thinking. Oh, no, that's what they deserve. And God is telling his people, no, here's what I want you to love. 
I want you to love mercy more than you love judging others. I want you to love kindness and grace and mercy so much so that you start to show it to others. Because right? Right? it's not just a meant to be a, oh man, I love it. I, I love receiving God's grace and mercy in my life. But what is he calling us to do is, okay, well now go show grace and mercy to others. Go show people kindness. And God's word is filled with examples for how you and I can do this. In the, the gospel reading in Matthew chapter five, the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus say to do? Good stuff, right? <laughs> Go help others so that they will do what? Worship God. They will glorify God and they go, oh, that's the kind of God that I want to worship and praise. A, a God who is filled with mercy and favor and kindness. And the reason Jesus says this is what you're supposed to do as Christians is because how are they going to know God is like that? Think about that for me. How are they going to know? Yeah, God is full of chesed. He is full of mercy and kindness and favor and grace for sinners. They're going to know it because of you and me. Because of the church. Because you and I go out in the world and we begin to love mercy and kindness and favor. We begin to show it in our words and our actions to people who are in need of it. And the book of James re-emphasizes this, right? And says, yeah, you meet someone in need and you go, good luck, buddy. I'm cheering for you. Okay, that's a nice thing to say, right? I know he, James said it much more formally, okay? Don't get mad at me. He says, don't just tell them, I hope you get what you need. Hey, stay warm, be well fed, that's wonderful. What does James actually tell us to do? What does God's word tell us to do? To actually meet the need, right? To show mercy and kindness to someone that is hurting and in need. We go, oh, okay, we can meet that need, we're gonna do it. And see, this is one of the things that our church does a good job of in a variety of ways, including the food pantry and all kinds of other acts of service that people do to help those in need. But what I would encourage you to do is to think and pray about, okay, well, well what else could we do? To, to be a witness to God's mercy in our lives so that other people would see that witness and go, oh, their father in heaven must be amazing. Let's go. Y'all track it along with this, all right? Now, when I say that and we look at God's word, we go, boy, that's really neat. <clears throat> However, there's a lot of people in need in the world, aren't there? Right? And it can feel way overwhelming. We go, oh, wow, what a wonderful idea. No, they can't meet all those needs, right? Anybody ever thought that? You're like, boy, I'd love to help, but it's, it's a lot. So here's a, a piece of wisdom that I learned a long time ago from a person. And they said it this way. They said, do for one what you can't do for all, right? Do for one person what you, what you and I would know, like, is totally impossible to do for everybody. I can show mercy and kindness. I can meet a need for at least this one person. Maybe they can't meet all their needs. Maybe I can't do it for every single person I know that needs that kind of love and care. But I can do it for them in this moment, right? Now, there's another way to think about mercy. Sometimes it is acts of love and service in action, right? Meeting. Another way to think about mercy that God's word teaches us is to think about comfort, Right, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, God says, comfort, comfort my people. And it's followed up about why we should be comforted. He says, because I've, I've pardoned all their transgressions. I've pardoned all their sins. See, sometimes showing mercy is what James says to do. 
meeting a physical need, somebody out, showing the kindness of God to them. And other times, showing mercy is what Isaiah says, which is speaking words of comfort to somebody that is hurting, that is heavy hearted. And you and I have a choice of what to do with our our words. You and I can pile on. We can use words of condemnation. We can use words of judgment, right? Those thoughts in our heart where we go, I'm better than this person, can very quickly become um, words that we speak. Or we can do what God's word says, and we can speak words of comfort, right? We're going to remind them, you know, Jesus still loves you. Jesus is still for you. Jesus has forgiven that sin. Jesus has redeemed you. Now, I just want you to think for a moment. This is not a hard question. Which one of those do you think gives life to another person? The words of, well, you get what you deserve. Oh, that was a stupid choice. Well, you're an idiot. Or... Hey, here's a little comfort. God still loves you, even when you mess up. One of those gives life, right? And that's what it means to to love mercy, is to give life rather than judgment. Whether it's by speaking words of comfort and grace and mercy to remind people, no, Jesus is still for you and he forgives you. Or it's reminding them through a physical action and meeting a physical need. It says, no, see, you have not been forgotten. God still loves you. Paul in 2 Corinthians summarizes it for us very well. So if you have a Bible, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Or if you're taking notes, write down 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 3. Paul says this. He says, Blessed God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. So what Paul is saying is we want to worship and praise God for his work in our lives. And then we want to be witnesses of that work. He is the God of mercies. And he's the God of all comfort. And Paul says, who comforts you? Right? How many of you have ever been comforted by promise of God when you were hurting or struggling, right? And Paul goes, oh, that's great. Bless the Lord for that. Praise God for his comfort in your life. Here's what you ought to do with it now. You go be a witness by comforting others, by bringing God's mercy to others. And see, Jesus is the God of all comfort. One of my favorite theologians says it this way, that in Jesus, God was essentially telling us, I know what it's like. Right? Hebrew says he was tempted and suffered in every way that we do. So Jesus, when we look at him, we go, oh, no, he really is the God of all comfort because he understands what I'm going through. He has felt all the pains of human life and hurt and anguish. And his response to you and me is to comfort us in all of it. And what I love is that Paul says, and then you and I take that comfort, take that mercy that is given to us, and we share it with others. So this is what loving mercy looks like, that we bless God, we praise God for the mercy that he's shown to us in Jesus. But then we go and share that mercy with the world. It never just stays with us. Paul is telling you it was never intended to stay with just you because guess what? There's a whole bunch of people in the world who need comfort, who need mercy, and who need the mer- God of mercy and comfort. And here's the wild thing. He's asked you and empowered and entrusted you to be the witnesses, to be the one that brings his comfort to somebody else. 
And like I said, there's a whole world filled with people that need comfort and mercy, who need the God of mercy and comfort. But instead of just sitting there doing nothing, going, well, <laughs> there's billions of people and I'm just one person, it's never going to happen. And we simply go, oh, okay, well, who's the one person in my life or this week or this month that I know needs some mercy, who needs some kindness, who needs a word of comfort? And then we ask God to say, okay, give me an opportunity to be the witness to your comfort and mercy that brings that comfort and mercy to them. So this is what we're gonna be about as a church. We're gonna be witnesses who point to a God of mercy, a God of mercy who pardons all sins through Jesus Christ, a God of mercy who blesses us and cares for us and meets our needs so that we can bless and care for and meet the needs of others. And as Paul says, a God who comforts us in all of our sufferings, all of our anguish, so that we can be people who share that comforting good news of Jesus with others. Let's pray. Lord God, we give thanks for the mercy, the kindness, and the grace that you pour into us each and every day through Jesus Christ. We bless you and praise you that you have forgiven and pardoned all and then in our times of need and hurt and anguish, you meet us through your Holy Spirit and comfort us. May we be witness to the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our lives. May we be witnesses who go out into the world and do for just one person what you have done for us by speaking words of mercy and comfort into their lives. In your name we pray. Amen.